This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome, everybody, to a special edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John McAroon, here in New Jersey covering the Detroit Lions this week. Tonight, it's the first preseason game. Everybody's excited. I know you're not going to see all the starters, those players that you know and love, but a lot of opportunities for second and third stringers to play. So had an opportunity to cover the two joint practices. Now, right after, sweating my balls off in New Jersey in the thickest humidity I've ever been a part of. Two two-hour practices, sweat drenched. But to bring you guys coverage, here I am. I'm looking forward to breaking it all down with my guy, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. It was crazy, but it's unfortunate that, you know what, um, the practices were physical. Some lines got dinged up. It started off with the announcement that Dan Campbell made that Sam Laporta was not going to practice. He's got a light, uh, slight hamstring situation, so it shouldn't be too serious. Kevin Zeitler got dinged up. Tyrion Arnold got dinged up, colliding with Andrew Thomas. And then the, the most unfortunate news is after Monday's practice, which was so aggressive, just full of skirmishes, just in person to see it, it's, it's just crazy. A aggressive, tension-filled situation that just really, really uh, became really kind of unprofessional. It just it, a lot of pauses. It just kind of broke up the the rhythm of football. So uh, there's reasonings behind it. We'll, we'll share that here. But it was unfortunate to hear the news. Defensive back Emmanuel Mosley, torn pectoral after two ACLs. The guy is just purely snake bitten, man. It's just you, you, you have a practice, you're, you're battling, and then you've got another situation in which a long-term injury is going to impact the defense. I know there's a lot of competition, but when you lose a player like that, it just it stings a little bit. When you recognize just how much work the man has put in to try and get back. But unfortunately, Lions again will not have the benefit of, of knowing what Emmanuel Mosley can bring to this defense. Do you feel like he's brittle at this point? I mean, it's, it, it's one ACL, it's two ACLs. And then it, honestly, last year he was, he played what, one play, two plays, and he blew out his ACL. And now this just trying to get through training camp. And this is early in training camp. This isn't even late. I get it. It's a joint practice. I get it that. It was a heated joint practice, and I get there there was a lot of physicality in this joint practice. But, I mean, geez, man, at a certain point, like you said, he is snake bit, but I also think he's brittle. I think this might be the end of the road for a guy like Emmanuel Mosley. I don't know what else he has in the tank. Now, look, it's a, it's a torn peck, and we've seen um, – uh, what CD Deuce come back from this last season and was able to to give you some valuable snaps in the playoff run. So there, there's the possibility that he'll be able to come back. And if you listen to Dan Campbell, Dan Campbell basically said as much. Look, he's going to give him time to get his legs underneath him. It'll give him time to make sure that knee is fully rehabbed, and then we'll be able to possibly get him back later to the season. But I mean, good God, man, this guy since you've signed him. He has given you a snap, and that is it. He has been injury-plagued since you've brought him to the Lions, and I don't know if he has much of a rope left in his career. It's hard enough coming back from one ACL, but now you're trying to come back from two ACLs, and then you tear your pec. That's a big-time injury. I don't know if he has any more tread on the tires And I think he's brittle. Would that be an accurate statement or am I just kind of being a dick here? It's tough in that we wouldn't say brittle because the man works his tail off. It's a tough position. But I would say that some bodies just unfortunately can't handle the situations in which you're going up against guys bigger, faster, stronger. It is a tough situation in which the Giants came out looking to be physical. It's unfortunate. Um, The torn pectoral muscle. You recognize the challenge that the guys had. So it, it's going to be a situation in which, you know, Dan Campbell said on Tuesday morning, he's going to battle to try and come back, but it's just part of his process. Mm-hmm. It's uh, one of those things where some players just deal with certain injuries. And look, part of it is, is that when you rehab one injury, you sometimes, you know, you got to 
tailor your workouts to certain things so that you're strength. You see what I'm saying? You can't just go yeah. balls to the wall and be physical. Like when we get nicked up, if you just look at it from a simple perspective, if your knee hurts, then you overcompensate one body part and you just can't be like the full strength. So he was still working his way back. There was no guarantee he was going to start. Sure. Um, so there's opportunities that he had. It's just really unfortunate. And to talk about the mindset of the Giants. So if you follow Detroit Sports Podcast, Lions on SI, you realize last year the Giants came to town. And basically day one, the Lions punked the Giants. Well, everything in football gets blown up. But in New York, it's just totally different. It basically sat with them for 365 days that the Lions out physical them and really embarrassed them on day one. And so that was the narrative coming in is don't let the Lions embarrass you. And it can get to that point. Like the Lions want to play physical. They want to play aggressive. So the, the Giants said, all right, you're coming to our house. We're just going to start punching. And that's what it was. Like the, the, the best way to describe it was on Monday, there would be a rep and then there'd be a little extra pushing and shoving, a little extra shit talking. And then another rep would happen and then more pushing and shoving. And it wasn't just like a light bump in the shoulder. It was two hand pushes. It was aggression. It was craziness. So then they just started swinging. You're not going to mess with us. I'm on Ross St. Brown. He's not going to take that. So when he's getting pushed and shoved, he starts swinging. And that's what it became. It became a, oh, you want to come punk us? So then the Lions retaliated and it just became skirmish after skirmish. It got too much. I think both coaches realized it. There's that battle, that line between comp- competition and letting your emotions get the best of you because it was so hot. It was hot as fuck out there. Like it, to describe it, beautiful weather. But 95 degrees and pure humidity where if you're out there for five minutes, I was sweating. I was like, whoa. And it was just imagine now battling against someone who's probably insulting your family and then insulting your madhood and then pushing you after a rep. The, there was no patience for that bullshit from the Lions. So they swung. And then, of course, Tuesday you thought it would be better. But no, you had uh, Malik Neighbors, if you see online, the guy's coming in and he just – puts his hand right in the face with a shove in an aggressive manner toward Kirby Joseph. He ain't taking that. So Kirby Joseph took a full swing. So this was craziness. I've, you know, you've seen it on television. I've heard about it repeatedly about camp brawls, but to see it for two days of just nonstop brawls, it was crazy. I thought it marred the practices a little bit, but we still got a lot of good assessments to talk about. But I just thought the, 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 aggressiveness to see that many skirmishes was crazy to see. Do you think this bleeds over into the game on, on Thursday? Do you think some, there's a little bit of carryover, maybe, maybe going through a whistle, not playing to the whistle uh, in this, in this preseason game? No, because a lot, a lot of the, the key figures that were brawling are not going to play. I got you. Um, I would be, I would be surprised if you see Amon Ross St. Brown, mm-hmm. Derek Barnes, Kirby Joseph, you're not going to see these people. So they got it all out. They're like, I got my weeks of work in because now Wednesday's off day, Thursday's going to be for the second and third stringers and rookies, and you got Friday, Saturday. Probably not. None of these guys are going to play football again probably till next Monday or, or Sunday. So they got it out of their system. It's this craziness. I do think that you know a lot of these guys uh, wanted to show on tape that they were aggressive and weren't going to back down. But no, I think that uh, now the focus will shift to making plays, and because we do got like I said to continue this concern. Hennon Hooker is not moving his way up the depth chart as a result of practice. He does not look good. He's still struggling with pre-snap reads, uh, getting the offense set the right way, doing exactly what Ben Johnson wants, and a lot of mistakes. And day two wasn't a lot better than day one, so that's the observations that were made. And you just look at it and you say, I just think that it's safe at this point. I don't know, maybe you know, maybe there's certain players when the lights come on, but he's not going to go up against – top stringers so you have to caution that if he goes out there and has some success you know maybe he'll throw the ball nicely to Caden Davis or Fountain or those that are battling but um, you also have to remember he's going up against second stringers when he's played against third you know second and third second stringers on the Lions hasn't looked that great so we'll see if that competition ramps up but it's concerning I think the biggest concern is from what I saw is Hennon Hooker and I would say not that I have concern about the secondary, but it is just so tough when you have elite wide receivers. Like the Lions were playing a little bit back, a little bit too soft, and the Giants were running eight-yard ins and just taking advantage and doing quick plays. But I would say this, even with elite cornerbacks, top-end receivers just 
it's just so much easier to get open, find creases, and mm-hmm. make big plays. Malik Neighbors was highlight material. Just seeing it in person, smooth route runner, six foot tall, just give me the ball, I'll get it for you. And he just, you know, maybe they said, okay, maybe one or one incompletion that maybe went out of bounds is contested, but basically targeted 17, 18 times and made 16 catches. A couple touchdowns, he got, uh, he toasted, uh, Terry and Arnold, but Terry and got back as well. So all in all, Malik Neighbors won the joint practices for the Giants, all in all, but it, but it's good because it gives the Lions work to see that, hey, this is what it takes for Ennis Rakestraw, Terry and Arnold. Stephen Gilmore, Amik Robertson, Carlton Davis. A lot of good work for these guys. I wouldn't be too concerned, but I will say this. The league neighbors definitely put on a show for everybody to see in New Jersey. Yeah, speaking of that, like with the show that he basically put on, it, did the line secondary get exposed in these practices? Because it, it sounds like it wasn't just one cornerback. It doesn't sound like it was just one play. You mentioned what he did. What you say it was uh, 16 for 17 on targets. I mean, that's that's a pretty good clip. And if you've seen any of the footage that's been kind of passed around either on Twitter or online, it looks like they had a bit of a field day. And it really does look like they took advantage of that line secondary. And it, it sounds like some of this was kind of egged on by, by Brian Dable, uh, who got pretty excited because uh, the Lions were, were celebrating some of their defensive stops that they had going on. But... Again, remember, this is a very young secondary who just lost a, a piece in Emmanuel Mosley. And it kind of feels like in this specific moment, that secondary maybe wasn't ready to rise to the occasion. Uh, yeah, they're young. Carlton, remember, too, it takes time to gel together in communication. And look, it had the feel of they weren't like the Lions weren't playing strong press man, like right up to the line of scrimmage. They were giving a little bit of cushion, so I think they were working on some strategies of just like, hey, let's be in this certain spot at this time. Like, they're not game planning. So what that means is they just want to have everybody line up properly, make the plays, compete, but they're not, like, matching up so intently where it's like, hey, uh, Aaron Glenn's going to make a call, be in too high safety at this point, and let's see what happens. So there was a – and plus – you know NFL offenses, a lot of dink and dunk, a lot of four yard outs, a lot of, you know, like slants and things mm-hmm. like that. And then, and then periodic tests. And it's, it's basically the best way to put it is like 85% speed where you're not going full speed to try and destroy the person. But, you know, if a guy's running free, you're not going to lunge into him, but you're going to try to make the play. So, um, the, the best way to put it is the Lions first string defense look good, but behind them, uh, the Giants made some plays today. And on Monday, I looked at the offense, and the offense was looking pretty good, uh, doing their thing. Uh, Jamison Williams was the highlight. So, you know, a lot of good things, a lot of things to clean up is, is the best way to put it. And, and, and what they got to clean up is in regards to coverage is just basically positioning, uh, closing speed, things like that, recognizing for Terry and Arnold what an opportunity he's going to learn, um, which was crazy is, um, you know, Mike, it was so hot. It was just tough, but it, you got to go through it to learn on the picture. I posted at Detroit podcast. That was the rep that, that neighbors got the touchdown. I didn't film. I was just like, I want to take the picture and put my phone away because my hands were full of sweat. So I just said, Oh, Terry matching up against neighbors. So I put out a tweet and I said, Oh, the next rep they're out again. And I just took the picture and that was the rep where Terry is in good coverage against neighbors, but he was looking right at him. He didn't turn his head around to put, to be able to track the ball and, and knock the ball down. He's mm-hmm. going to learn invaluably from that. Just, Hey, you were right with him, step for step, dog for dog. All you got to do is fundamentally turn your head, knock the ball down. That's invaluable experience that he's going to get from that one rep alone. And I just think that the lions are going to rebound nicely and, and have some strong competition, but yeah, you're going to have some tough days where a Watson from Green Bay or a Justin Jefferson might torch you and, or, you know, some, some great wide receivers because these receivers are bigger, faster, stronger. And when you see it live, it's pretty sick how fluid they can move and get open. It's For precise. Sure. It's pretty sick how fast they can get open and how, how precise they can be. But I do want to get your sense, too, when you look at it. Jamison Williams, are you buying in now when you see him scamper past the defensive back? 
by galloping, by just turning on the Jets. Because I, I think he can have – it's it's pretty much a certainty now. When you see him do it in a practice mode where he can break free, he can embarrass a lot of people. If he takes this seriously, we could be seeing the start of a Justin Jefferson-like run for Jamison Williams. He's the truth. He did it. He's able to break free. And if, if he has that connection, we could be seeing the special truth here with Jamison Williams. It was nice to see live in person. I think the key word in your sentence is if, if he takes yes. this seriously. Yes. Look, Jamison Williams has had all of the talent forever in a day, right? Like he was special in college. He's shown glimpse of being incredibly special in the pros. It's really putting it all together and it's getting the reps with Jared Goff. If you look at his first two years, both of them have been hampered with silly stuff. One was rehabbing from, from the ACL injury. The other was the gambling situation and the suspension. And then it was fighting to come back from all of that and get the playing time because they were already in, in go mode. So it's, it's really putting it all together and being on the same page as the quarterback. We've seen countless times where he's blown by a defender and he's not in the spot where he needs to be. He's, he's three yards too high and Jared Goff's throwing it to where he needs to throw it to and, and JMO is, is just kind of leaking out towards the top because he's ready to go and break it open. Well, that's not how the play is designed. The play is designed a certain way. I need you to be in a certain spot. And if you've watched, if you've watched Netflix receiver, it, there's a part where I believe it's Justin Jefferson's talking about how being a wide receiver, it's more than just running routes. It's more than just, just, you know, breaking a play open and taking the top off the defense. It's, you have to be in a certain spot. If that if that play and that route, you've had this route tree since you were a kid. If that route calls for you to be uh, 12 yards up and over to the right, then you better be 12 yards up and over to the right. You can't be 13 yards up and over. It's not how it works. It, it's all based on timing and execution, and you have to follow the route tree the way the route tree has been drawn up because everything runs on a clock. So I, I think, again, if is the big word here, if he puts it into practice, if he puts, if he takes it serious, if he gets on the same page with uh, Jared Goff, if he does all the things he's supposed to do, you could have an elite wide receiver. You could have a guy who has the ability to flip games on their heads and just take complete control. You could have your Tyreek Hill. Again, big if. He's got to put it all together. I think what you've seen – is you've seen a guy who watched Amon Ross St. Brown come in and work. You've seen a, he's seen a, a guy like Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, take studying seriously. Seen Amon Ross St. Brown take practicing seriously. Seen Amon Ross St. Brown come in with this chip on his shoulder and knowing that there has to be work done. Sometimes players who are incredibly gifted, like JMO is, their practice habits are, are very sloppy. They're weak. They don't go through uh, the, the the routes the way they're supposed to. They're not as dialed in as they're supposed to because ultimately their talent can compensate for anything that they don't do on the practice side. Uh, you can watch a guy like Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel was able to win a couple games in the NFL. That guy didn't study at all. But because of his freakish athletic ability and his ability to imp improv and improvise on the fly, he was able to take games over. Guys who have talent like JMO do, sometimes those practice habits get sloppy. That dedication's not there. You're not willing to put that grind in. And then what happens is it doesn't necessarily show up on game day. And especially in an offense like this, where it is very meticulous, it is very precise. You have a quarterback who is very demanding. He's not going to throw you the ball if he doesn't trust you. He's not going to throw you the ball if you're not where you're supposed to be. He's not going to get you the rock, and you need the rock in your hand to be able to take this game over. Again, if JMO is willing to do the grind and put it all in, and he's taken lessons from Amon or St. Brown. He's worked with Teddy Bridgewater. He talked about the impact that Teddy had on him last year. I think you're going to see this guy who has now kind of put things together, who's matured, who now has this better view and this better point of view on what he has to do and what being a wide receiver is in the National Football League. It's not, it's not necessarily easy. Yeah, you got great talent, and your great talent can only take you so far. You still got to put the work in. You still got to rep it out, and you still have to be able to to carry yourself in a certain manner and gain that respect from your quarterback and from the rest of your teammates. And I think he's doing that. I'm yeah. willing to say at this moment in time, 
he is going to be a much better player and he's going to be much more involved in this offense than he has the previous two years. I think there are going to be games this season that he completely dominates and he's going to be the wide receiver one in certain games. That being said, I'm not willing to go out on the limb and say this guy is going to be Justin Jefferson. I'm not willing to go out on the limb and say that this guy is going to be uh, a top five wide receiver. I need to see more. I, I Look, I can see the tools are there, but I need to see more. Yeah, yeah. You want to see it in person, not against, you know, practice where, you know, you're not going exactly full speed. I want to yeah, see it week in, week out. You know what I'm consistently. saying? Consistently. Like, yes, I don't want you yes. to have a, a flash in the pan game. I need to see you doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing a couple games in a row. I need to see a game where you get two targets, and I need to see you keep your head on straight and not go yes. to the media and not lose your shit. I need you to, to keep it professional. I need to see those things. You know what I'm saying? No doubt about it. Um, I do think that with the Detroit Lions, the games are going to be key. The preseason is going to be key for a lot of the young guys. First opportunities for Ennis Regstraw, Terion to get some action and get out there and see some competition. Uh, Hendon Hooker, Nate Sudfeld, uh, guys like Broderick Martin, Makai Wingo, the rookie, Sione Baki. There's so many good opportunities for guys like Caden Davis, the receivers like Fountain, and, you know, Donovan Peoples-Jones to see if there's something there. But uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight to see how it all shakes out. MetLife Stadium directly next to me. Uh, the missus found a great hotel where I can basically hop, skip, and a jump, and I'll be at uh, my third stadium now in the National Football League. And uh, hopefully it's a good opportunity. And number one key for everybody that plays NFL football in any capacity, stay healthy. Mm-hmm. And right now the Detroit Lions took a unfortunate situation with a couple injuries that have been uh, kind of derailing the team with uh, Laporta. And Rodrigo didn't practice Tuesday, but they're all minor. You know, uh, Laporta was Laporta was seen uh, on the practice field, um, on the workout field, just stretching a little bit. So it'll be opportunity, hopefully, to get back next week when they kick back training camp back in Allen Park. I'm glad you brought up the injuries because it's one of those things where, you know, we look at this team, we're like, okay, they're pretty healthy, they're pretty healthy. And then all of a sudden you start seeing guys start to go down. Like uh, you end up um, losing Michael Badgley. I mean, consider it a big deal, not a big deal, whatever you want. But then Mosley gets hurt. Mosley was supposed to be playing. He was taking first team reps as as a nickel cornerback. I think that that has a significant impact on this roster. Um, then you've got Laporta dealing with a bit of a hamstring. Those things can linger and those things can become problems. Uh, you've got um, uh, Zeitler banged up a little bit. Uh, Terry and Arnold they had to go into concussion protocol for him. Now he's healthy, but still. It's early, and these guys are starting to take hits and starting to take bumps. And 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 look, Dan Campbell has talked about it in the past. You got to build that callus, right? You gotta you gotta get your body used to getting hit. Um, you gotta get your you gotta get everything used to being rocked around. You gotta be able to take these bumps. So, yeah, it's a good thing that 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 Terry and Arnold's not hurt, and it's a good thing that some of these guys sound like they're not not really banged up. But you're starting to lose players. And we haven't even got to the first preseason game. How concerned are you with the injury bug derailing this team and really, really hampering it? I mean, again, Mosley's a guy who was going to be a rotational player. But again, he was taking first team reps. He was a guy who was getting a solid look. And the way that that defense has been put together, we're going to talk a little bit about the depth chart here in a moment. But. With you know taking a look at the depth chart, you might now need to start moving guys around and pulling guys out of sp- spots that they've been training in for the last couple weeks because now you're losing guys, or you got to lean on a guy like an Ernest Rakestraw who's now got to take more reps and he's got to be prepared. And this is a situation that maybe they weren't expecting right away because again, cornerbacks take a little bit of time to develop; they need a little bit of seasoning. Now this guy is going to get thrust into into a, a, a starting role or he's next man up uh, and, and he's got to be able to to perform. And does he have the ability to now step in and kind of fill some of those shoes for a guy like a like a like a uh, like a Mosley? So is there a is there a bit of a concern or is there a growing concern maybe with the Lions or, or even with you that these injuries could come around and really snake bite this team? One position offensive line. If you lose Frank Ragnow, you lose Glasgow, Zeitler, Sewell, Decker, 
what's behind them is okay, but not enough to be championship. I think the depth across the board, defensive line, uh, you expect DJ Reader to start. That really pushes things down the depth chart so that Broderick Martin can fill in. Uh, Levi Onzerike, I think, is solid. Um, you haven't really heard Josh Pascal's name too much, but mm-hmm. he's also a guy in the mix. James Houston. You have Marcus Davenport. So you have a lot of depth more on defense. Secondary might be, you know, a little rough if Arnold and Rakestraw go down. They could be interchangeable down the road, you know, with Rakestraw coming on strong. Um, you have Ifachi Melifanwu who can do. You have a lot of versatile guys on this roster, so the defense has more depth, but no team can sustain multiple big injuries. But the big concern, the before it would be cause for panic, like nobody can go down. Now there are more guys 1B that you can be comfortable with at multiple spots, where if St. Brown goes down, you maybe could put in Fountain or a Caden Davis for a game or two, and they can do okay, or a Colif Raymond, and they can get by because of the the depth uh, and the talent all across the offense. Uh, you look at Brock Wright, he emerged. So if something happens to Laporta, it's not going to be the same, but he can get some touches and do some things. The biggest area where you probably will have some nerves is if the offensive line has some injuries, that's going to be tough because Dan Skipper, Colby Sorsdahl, A. Wosika, they still got a lot to prove. And unfortunately, Christian Mahogany hasn't been there. Uh, uh, Giovanni Manu is raw as raw can be. He's, he's mm-hmm. basically, a, he's red shirt. So, um, I would say mild concern about injuries across the board, except high alert for the offensive line. If something happens to one of the starters, it, it could be a challenge as they try to, negotiate and flip it but I do trust in Brad Holmes to be able to go out there and look and see about upgrading certain spots the Lions have done a good job of of developing competition and having the roster and I think that when you look at the depth chart I think there's a lot of spots where the answers are starting to get set and I think that this lineup when you look at it probably the the starters on offense and defense are pretty much clear and it's just the 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 back end where this preseason will be a situation in which um, those that are, you know, some 40 to 53, the, the backups fighting to make the roster, that's where the competition will be during the preseason. That makes sense. And look, I think, like you said, it's important to get out of this first preseason game healthy. It's it's important to get through these preseasons, preseason games with with all your guys intact as much as possible. Uh, look, I think Dan Campbell does a really good job of getting these guys in the right mindset for the regular season. I think he does a good job getting their bodies ready for, for the regular season. I think he takes care of these guys as much as possible. You just need to, to not have anything unfortunate happen. With all that being said, the other day we did get our unofficial depth chart that was, that was sent out. And look, when I looked at it, I had a couple of takeaways, and I want to get your sense on on what you read into the depth chart because a couple of the things that that I took away from it. Donovan Peoples Jones has a lot more work to do if he's going to be the third wide receiver. That was a guy that we talked about. Right now, that's Cleef Raymond's spot, and Cleef Raymond has done a very good job the last couple of seasons being that third wide receiver. There have been times where he's been called on to be the second wide receiver and he stepped up and he's made big plays. If Donovan Peoples Jones, who is the guy that I think we all kind of projected to get that spot, if he wants that spot, he is at the bottom of that wide receiver room looking up and he's got more to prove. He's got a lot more work to do. I'm expecting to see him in this game against the Giants. Now, as far as tight ends go, James Mitchell might become a roster casualty. I, I'm not sure what you're reading into that situation, but James Mitchell might be a guy who's who might be the odd man out in that locker room uh, as far as tight ends go. And again, another guy who's got a lot of work to do, expecting him to show up and play in this game against the Giants. And we, we need to see him perform. He's got to be able to, to do something because uh, where he's – at on the depth chart, again, another guy looking up and there's multiple people in front of him. And then finally, Brian Branch. This is something that I was talking about with, with Mosley getting hurt and being injured. Mosley, now a full-time safety. That's where they've been repping him at. 
Last year he was he was your nickel guy, and he and he moonlighted a little bit at safety, moonlighted a little bit at corner. He was kind of uh, a utility knife for you. You could play all over that secondary. They're they're working him and they're repping him as a safety. Kirby Joseph and, and Iffy, I believe, are going to rotate in that other safety spot. But now with Mosley going down, does Brian Branch maybe get pulled out of that safety spot? And is he again doing safety part of the time? And is he doing nickel corner stuff the other part of the time? Are they going to have to, to again, use him like that utility knife and, and work him in different roles? It's it just, it, to me, that's the big thing with, with this Mosley injury that kind of sucks. Mosley was going to be a guy who was going to be uh, taking a lot of snaps at nickel. He was going to be a guy who, uh, if another cornerback went down, uh, he was going to rotate into the order of, of cornerbacks, and he was going to allow Brian Branch to to play uh, that safety role. So are things going to have to kind of change now with with the way the depth charts laid out because of this injury? So those are those are some of the things that I took away looking at the, at this depth chart. Yeah. Did you have any takeaways when you got the when you got the uh, unofficial official yes. depth chart? Right. It's unofficial because look, they have to do it. But remember, it's made by the communication staff. And I'll say this. In years past, it was completely irrelevant. Mm-hmm. They've actually done some work to make it believable to talk about where what you're seeing is, is pretty close. And it's no surprise Donovan Peoples-Jones is repping the third team right now. He's not doing well. And he's far behind Fountain and Davis. So he's got a lot of work to do in the, in, in the preseason games. Absolutely. I don't care if he was brought back. He's not doing nothing. He's not flashing. Players are – just passing him by. Fountain's making plays daily, and Caden Davis was working with the ones. You can see it online. He had a nice touchdown. He just shows up, makes plays, and that's what Dan Campbell likes. Donovan Peoples-Jones, that's not it. The other situation, and here's a, a fun nugget from Inside Quest Diagnostic Center. So remember we were talking about Hendon Hooker, right? So mm-hmm. he's lining up, and Ben Johnson's directly in front of me and all the reporters in the end zone. And Hennon Hooker is starting to run the play. Well, there's supposed to be some, some movement that doesn't take place. And just Ben Johnson's absolutely going ape shit before the snap. The play runs, nice little toss to uh, James Mitchell. He, you know, is in the end zone, but unfortunately, Ben Johnson is having a full on tantrum yelling at Hendon Hooker. And I just felt so bad for James Mitchell. I'm like, the man finally makes a semblance of a play. Like, the play kind of was just, I think everybody was kind of just in awe of Ben Johnson just screaming. And it was kind of like one of those plays where I think a lot of the line went to the left and it was a nice little toss to James Mitchell. He just doesn't have to, like, battle anybody. He just takes a couple steps in. So he makes a nice catch and touchdown, and there's zero acknowledgement because – the the pre-snap reads were not done right. The motions, the shifts, it, the whole thing looked crazy. And Ben Johnson was just like lividly pissed. And it was great. It was just like James Mitchell. Yeah, you're right. He's the odd man out. It's just, it's not happening. It's, it's one of those things where it's definitely Sam Laporta. It's Brock Wright, Shane Zilstra because of his blocking. And, uh, James Mitchell, I think, is going to find himself challenged. He's got to make plays in this preseason, and it's going to be tough because um, I, I just see uh, just opportunities where maybe a fresh start for him might be something. Now to the key of what you're asking. I don't think Mosley's injury really affects things that much because here's why. Yeah. Mo- Mosley would have been a depth piece. It would have been a nice guy to throw in the nickel spot against bigger uh, slot guys, but right now you have three answers, and you maybe have a fourth. You have, right now, Amik Robertson and Ennis Rakestraw are going to battle it out. They're going to have reps, and they're going to be great. Ennis Rakestraw has three interceptions last week against the second team, but that's making plays. So that's two. Then And then you have Brian Branch you can throw in there who makes plays. And now Dan Campbell said it, and it might upset him, but, again, if Achimel Afanwu can play all over the defense, he can play outside corner. He can play in the slot because of his body type, his physicality, his propensity to blitz and get up there. So, unfortunately, Mosley was, I would say, going into our talk today, 
the fifth guy on the depth chart, but with talent. That's just really a great problem to have. But I don't have any concern because he wasn't on the field um, last year, and you got four other guys that can play in the slot. So the competition's stiff there. So it's not one of those things where you're hurting. You, you get hurt if one of those starting defensive backs, if, if Arnold or Carlton Davis goes down, now it gets a little bit tricky because you can still shuffle the guys in the second. The, the, the secondary upgrades have been great where you get competition, you get great work, and you can withstand an injury. Now you can't get too many more, like Iffy, uh, Brian Branch, Kirby Joseph, all those guys got to be integral and they got to be on the field. So I wouldn't be worried too much, but that depth chart was pretty sweet. It was pretty, pretty accurate. I, I liked where it sh- shook out. But at the same token, to self-promote, Lions on SI periodically will update our own unofficial depth chart where we give our predictions and uh, look at it. So always check it out. We'll always talk about it here, too. If you have any questions, uh, hit us up at Detroit Podcast. Um, I think our daily observations kind of give hints at who needs to do well. And uh, I'm sure you've checked it out where we said directly who's playing well. And, and in our notes, I put James Mitchell has to do more. I put in my notes that, hey, Mosley would have been a nice option at nickel, but that there's opportunities for others to make plays and if I do Melifano. So it's a crazy time right now, but the depth chart will shake out maybe a little differently as the preseason moves on. But it's good times for the Detroit Lions. I'm excited to check out the game uh, from MetLife on Thursday. We'll see how that all shakes out. But now, before we close the podcast, this is the portion of the podcast where – you you included it, I saw it, and I'm like, oh. Well, actually, before we get to it, because it is just something that's going to piss me off, I do want to share just a lighter moment from the experience. So Doc and Dayball are two peas in a pod. Why, <laughs> you ask? Well, let me tell you, Brian Dayball has pissed off the entire New York media. They walk in there, they try to ask questions, and he is, I listened to two of his sessions, stifling, just complete, bland, non-answers. He'll be there when he arrives. Yeah, we don't, I just learned about his injury. We'll evaluate it and uh, we'll let you guys know. Yeah, it's competition and we just hope that uh, the competition brings out the best in both teams. Bland as Nick Saban, Brian, um, as Bill Belichick can be, student of the game. I was like, oh, my God, this is unlistenable content. Like, you can't write this stuff. He can't, like, they were at, like, the New York media pressed him on one guy's injury for four questions, and he just said when, um, you know, he's got an injury, he's rehabbing it, and uh, when he's out there, uh, he'll, he'll get out there when he's healthy. Well, what's going on with him? You know fans get mad about injuries. Yeah, I don't want to rush things. You know, we always want to make sure the health of the player is good. Just dry, dry, dry. Well, after practice last year, I just had a brief talk with him, just a quick hi, good seeing you, and, uh, uh, you know, just a quick cordial interaction. Well, in our my research for this, I saw, you know, via the great Wikipedia page, I saw that Brian Dayball was a graduate assistant of Michigan State uh, from 98 to 99. Two years, he was a grad assistant at, at, in the, with the Spartans. So he was walking off after – the most bland, the most non-emotional presser I've ever heard. And I said, hey, coach, you know, just walk in. I said, hey, coach, uh, I just in my research, I saw that you were a grad assistant at Michigan State. And his face lit up like it was a completely different person. And he's like, wait, uh, you went there? I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, man. And he just started lifting off. Oh, you remember that Michigan game? You remember this? That? And he started lifting off plays like he became like he smiled. And he let his guard down completely. I was like in awe for a minute because it was going on for two, three minutes of just him recalling great plays. Like, remember this, this when we had that Michigan game? You remember this on the sideline? You remember, uh, oh, this is the Terrell did this, da da da. It was, it was great. And so again, it's a constant reminder that these guys don't want to give out any information in front of the microphone. But when you talk to them in a more private setting, in a more non 50 cameras in your face setting. It was great. He was nice, warm, like a normal human being. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he, he just let his guard down and he smiled. He walked off and in front of everybody, he's like, go green. And I said, go white. And I walked off. It was, it was really cool. Um, coach Dayball, like to me, 
I get it. Like, I don't judge guys. I, I obviously would love coaches that would give you content to write about. But it was cool to see it, at least to see his human side about something that was common about Michigan State. He was really cool. And uh, he lit up. He, he was excited to talk about it. And I'm sure day by day, he doesn't get excited to talk about, you know, the third string tight end's ankle injury. Right. And uh, all those New York, the New York media doesn't fuck around because, like, they, like, we, we get an answer and we move on. The New York media, they're like, why? Why is he hurt? Why is he not playing? When's he coming back? Like, they just are direct, and he just has that blank stare. If you just go look at the two media sessions from joint practices, that's competition. He's very, like, he got taught by Nick Saban, and that's how it is. So, but I got a chance to see the human side of Brian Dayball, and it was just nice to see. So now we're at the point where I get pissed off. <laughs> why? Why do you, we get you pissed off? You saved it for the end. We're saving it for the end. Why am I getting pissed off? Because I do not want to hear about Michigan and their cheating and all the people that are like, well, Michigan's not having their national title getting taken back, so I'm going to disregard the 53 texts that maybe didn't get deleted or didn't get deleted. Like, look, I get it. You, The blessing of talking to you is you've been straight out saying Michigan cheated. They deserve punishment. But the, but the more you hear about this story that has now resurfaced, people have gone back to their camps and are like, now they're so flippant. They're like, so what? Yeah, it, it kind of shows that Sharon Moore maybe knew about it. Yeah, that kind of debunks the theory that he is a lone wolf. Eh, who cares? Ah, eh, you can't take away the memories. Oh, Spartans and Buckeyes are all pissed off. And I'm just like, Michigan was served another notice of allegations that have details that some inappropriate things happen. So it is one of those things, and the reason why it bothers me is it puts you directly in a moral dilemma. Michigan cheated. They benefited. A lot of people are happy. A lot of people are chirping online, getting into their blue wall and, and, and trying to chip away at the meaning of the report. But in the end, I no longer care. Michigan did what they did. I would accept it if my program did the same thing. It's just annoying because the SICA fans that just will not bend and just say, yeah, all you have to do is say the answer that's proper is, yeah, Michigan did some things that were probably outside the line of appropriate and ethical, and they did some things that people knew about. And you know what? That's in the name of winning. That's what you're supposed to do. But to to double down and triple down and say I don't care, ha ha, Michigan State fans, it's not right. Michigan cheated. Just acknowledge it. Smile and say, yeah, they maybe did some things that they learned Georgia did and Alabama did and 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 uh, Auburn did. All the schools in the world cheat. It's no secret that they do it. But to bury your head in the sand with lies upon lies. And then everybody takes a fact and twists it into a non-fact. That is annoying to see. And I always look at it and I go, look, Adam and I talked about it. They cheated. It's pretty clear. There was a guy standing on the sideline of another university. And you just thought that nobody knew about it. And he just got funded by some stranger that didn't care about Michigan. And he just did his thing. Yeah, okay. Come on, guys. All this – when – all the facts are pointed out. Michigan's guilty. And for you to keep defending it, it just makes you look bad. Just admit it, smile, and say, yeah, they cheated. And that's what everybody does. Am I wrong here? Or how are you handling these new revelations that, you know, Sharon Moore deleted some texts or maybe had them in his to-be-deleted texts and probably is going to face maybe a suspension? I mean, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> right, right. I mean, this is nothing new. I this is kind of where we were at last year. I, I don't know why there's this gigantic startling revelation. I think the big thing is uh, the NCAA still not done with Michigan, right? They still want blood. It, it, it's weird because the NCAA came out last year and was like, look, Michigan's not going to have to vacate their championship. Michigan's going to have to do da, 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 da. this, that, and the other thing, right? But still, the NCAA wants some type of carcass from Michigan from last year. And it seems like they're trying to set an example. 
So all this new stuff's kind of getting rehashed and brought back up to the forefront. I mean, when you come out and you you validate their championship that they won and you validate the wins that they had and you say that they don't have to to lose any of those things, what are we doing here? What what's what's the point? Like to me, I think we all pretty much understood Sharon Moore was a part of this. I think as much as Harbaugh wants to say he didn't know what was going on, uh, Harbaugh is not apologizing for this, that, or the other thing. Harbaugh knew exactly what was going on. I'm, I'm almost positive you could you could map this out where he might have been the guy who put it all together, and then he was like, "I can't be a part of this. This is I put this together, but I'm I'm out. So do what you will with it." I, I mean. To me, none of this is surprising. None of this is is really new. I, I'm not sure what the NCAA wants to do here or what they're looking to kind of get from this. A, at this moment in time, I myself just want to kind of move on from it. But again, I'm a Michigan fan. So as a as a Michigan State fan or an Ohio State fan, if you know you want more blood, I get it. You want to laugh, I get it. You want to thumb your nose at that school. I get it. Like, I understand. Uh, I think last year was a bit of a clown show. Yeah, I was happy they won the national championship. The national championship will be forever tainted in my eyes. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's how I am. It's That's where I'm at. I feel like I'm a reasonable Michigan fan. I'm not like a lot of the slaps that are out there. I'm not like a lot of the guys who are in the media that went to that school. So for me, I, I look, I Michigan did wrong. And if the NCAA wants to come down and crush them, so be it. If, you know, Michigan wants to, to feign, uh, that they're, that they're innocent, sure. But like, who believes that? Nobody believes that. Uh, I can't wait for this Netflix documentary to come out on Connor Stallions. Like, th- that's going to be so interesting to me. Hopefully they've got some juicy nuggets in there. We can talk about that, but it, it, this doesn't surprise me. This doesn't shock me. I feel like if you're a Michigan fan, you you should be upset that this actually took place. Uh, be happy with your national championship, but be upset that that this cheating took place and this scandal happened. And if you're your Michigan State or your Ohio State or you're any other university, I get that you're mad. I get if you are upset because what took place impacted what was going on between the lines. A lot of times when we talk about stuff with Ohio State, we talk about other things that have gone on with Michigan State, those things were were more or less recruiting violations or it was coaches basically playing with themselves and in, in, in doing dumb stuff, right? Like it, it didn't necessarily impact the integrity of the game per se. This stuff impacted what was taking place on that field. You had guys knowing plays before – other stuff was going on, and it allowed them to to get to a spot faster. It allowed them to force a turnover. It allowed them to take advantage of different schematics that opposing players and opposing teams had. So you should be upset, and if you are, I, I totally understand. Uh, at this moment in time, I'm kind of over this whole thing. I kind of thought that we were able to move on from it after – uh, what happened last year, and I find it really funny that the the word is Michigan is willing to fight this thing tooth and nail. I, I don't know necessarily what you're willing to fight. Like you've got a head coach now who's been caught multiple times doing things that are wrong. So w- what are we fighting here? I mean, at this point, you are a multiple time offender. You got to take your punishment. And let's just move on with this. That's where I'm at. Yeah, no doubt. So you look at it and you say, okay. Accept it. it. There's going to be stuff, but, uh, you know, there's just different reports at different times when you recognize that, you know, there might not be punishments. But I'm curious, as all hell, what Connor Stallion is going to say. He sold a story, and uh, I just, I mean, what, does he just lie? Does he just say, I, I, I love Michigan, and I felt like I need to do this to be competitive, or all teams do it? Does he just throw that out there? So I can't wait. Uh, is it is it going to be coming up in the next week or two? Is it coming out or? Is uh, it I think it comes out end of August. I'm end not 100 okay. sure for sure the date, but it will be on Netflix. I know you have a Netflix account. Yeah. Um. You. I'm, I'm looking. Up, I'm looking it up right now on online while we talk about it. Um. But I, I think it's. I 
think it is end of end of August. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, released on August 27th. So end of August it'll come out. Got it. It'll be crazy to see. It's called um, Sign Stealer, I believe. Sign Stealer. <laughs> what a what a. Uh, there's more to come. Uh, it's gonna be crazy to see. Um, uh, it's gonna be crazy to see what is revealed in this in this story. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the way in which it's presented. Documentaries. You also gotta remember our slanted in a way that you know can sell. Like you 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 can selectively edit certain things a certain way to make it appear your story is a different thing. So it's going to be fascinating to see. I'm very curious to see how it's going to shake out because it just bothers me. It just gets me all upset because when you deny reality, you live in denial. It's, it's when a lot of corruption can take place and you can justify it. But look, I think Jim Harbaugh knew smartest guy in the room that you can, you know, sneak, you know, your way through the system and handle business and you can, uh, you can try to skirt it by leaving. And a lot of coaches did it before. It's basically he followed the Pete Carroll playbook to a T. And mm-hmm. he's like, oh, this is the playbook. This is what you need to do. And that's what uh, that's what is the um, the playbook that he ran. And I'm curious to see how um, how that shakes out moving forward. I love Harbaugh's statement that oh, I didn't do nothing. The integrity that's needed needs to be in a spot that's – uh, positive and hopeful. So we'll see how it plays out moving forward. Man, cause let me just tell you real fast. New York is crazy. A lot of unique people. It's still got that hustle and bustle energy. The pizza is legitimately crazy out of this world. Uh, Junior's cheesecake was spectacular. Uh, the food here has been good. It's pricey to get around, man. You can't get around. There's no parking. Parking's $25. There's like four spots every lot. It's horrible. So. Yes, uh, the advice is always to stay in New Jersey. And if you're, if you're close by East Rutherford, it's like five minutes from New York. And it's just a wild scene. Um, your cousin is like made for this place. She's like, I want to go back. And we're like, Andrea, there's, there's stuff we got to do with the kids. Like, she's like, I want to go back to New York. I'm like, okay, we've already been there twice and getting around is not easy. <laughs> so it's a hustle. And, 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 my my youngest is the same as me, and we're like, this is a little bit too overstimulating. There are people everywhere where you, you got some people just taking pictures normal, and then you got other people doing ballet in the streets. And the best way to put it is, you know, everybody talks about the honking. Well, there was a guy just looking at a car like two steps off the street. The Uber driver just honks. The guy just kept looking and didn't flinch. Like the man just stood there and acted like he'd heard it a thousand times. They're so numb to it. He just stood there, looked at the car. The guy honked and nothing happened. So it was crazy. It's a different vibe, but it's a one day vibe. Like I can't spend six days in New York. It's way too packed. It's way too crazy. And you, my wife definitely found the Cartier department and the Tiffany's and, 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 uh, I now have it seared in my brain. Fifth Avenue in New York is where all the high end shopping is and uh, definitely appealed to my wife and my daughters. Um, and it was very hilarious. There's different, different areas that you can go to. So I've enjoyed it for a day, but the best part is going to be for the kids to have fun and get out of town a little bit. So it's always different. Um, so um, it was a fun time. I can't wait to get back in town Friday and uh, I greatly appreciate the hour that we spent. What are you got? What do you got going on this weekend? Uh, this weekend, I, I'm going to try to go golf. And the I might be on kid duty on Saturday. The The wife has a, a concert she's going to. She's going to Kenny Chesney. So I might be on baby duty that day. I'm not. We haven't really discussed what she wants to do with the baby. Um, she was kicking around the idea of taking her to the concert because – the baby, we went uh, on Saturday. We ended up going to, to downtown Northville, and uh, there was a band playing. We kind of sat there, and the baby legit was was rocking out and, and vibing to the band. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. So she might want to take her to, uh, to the concert, um, or she might just get stuck with me. We might stay home and, and watch some TV or something. So it's either going to be baby duty or I'm going to get a night out, and uh, Sunday should be some golf for me. Nice. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSCROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. 
I challenge you to find a more dedicated sports page to Detroit sports fans. Just go out there and look around, see if anybody will trek across the country via car to bring you the coverage that you guys deserve and do what everybody else does. You want video? We give you video. You want opinions? We give you opinions. You want me to stick a camera in my face? I'll stick a camera in my face. You want, you want three, four, five, six podcasts a week? We'll do all that too. Any which way to bring you the best personalities, the best content. That's what at Detroit podcast does. Thank you. And I'll say this cause kudos to Doc and Jock. It, it has, it, it doesn't happen too often. I'm walking out of practice and a couple guys in line jersey stopped me and said, Hey, we listen to Doc and Jock. They just shouted out my name. Hey, Doc, what's going on? I, said, I looked. I said, what? And I said, we listen to Doc and Jock all the time. Thanks. I said, thank you. That was nice. I walked over. Another guy said, hey, Doc, what's going on? I said, what? What the hell's going on here? He's like, we listen every Thursday. I said, thank you. Thank you. I'll definitely pass it along to Adam. And you know what the message was to you, my friend? What do you think the Lions fans in New York want you to do? I have no idea. <laughs> they, they want you to be nicer to the Doc. I said, <laughs> I'm sure. I, I'm sure I, that's what they asked for. <laughs> for the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc, John Macaroon. Thank you so much for giving us the hour of your time every week. We greatly appreciate it. Doc and Jock will come back for sure next week, anywhere you listen to your favorite audio content. You fucking podcasters. I said don't let them in here. <laughs>